Welcome to the Kudan Open Lab seminar. Um, again, fully remote due to pandemic reasons. Uh, it's our greatest pleasure today to have Deb Verhoeven uh, from Australia, um, who uh, will speak about kinematics. She's also the PhD advisor of our very own um, Viunit Simatite, uh, who's a Kudan senior fellow, and um, she knows Deb way better than I do. Uh, and so she will be able to do much better justice to um, how awesome uh, the work of Deb is, which um, I obviously can see, um, but uh, Viuna knows her much better. So uh, Viuna will give us a little intro um, into the work or um, into what Deb is up to. Um, we have a time slot about two hours uh, as always. And um, typically um, we do 40 minutes lecture and then like sort of 80 minutes discussion, but this is actually up to our guests. So uh, Deb, if you would like to sort of um, moderate this in a sense that you want to you have discussion in between, you're free to do so. You, you're obviously free to talk longer, have a shorter discussion or talk shorter and have a longer discussion. So um, we're very, very open. It's just a two hour time slot we're sort of fixed. With that, I hand over the word to we units in my teeth. Yes, um, welcome Deb, so glad to have you here. As Max said, Deb used to be my PhD supervisor when I was uh, back in, at Deakin University in Australia. Well, now Deb is still in Australia, but officially in Canada, uh, in the University of Alberta, uh, the Canada 150 Research Chair in Gender and Cultural Informatics. Uh, so Deb started that position a couple of years ago now. Um, Deb is still leading uh, the research group Kinematics, uh, with which I did my PhD, and uh, Kinematics is by now dispersed all over the world. So we have people sitting in Canada, Australia, uh, Germany, and now Estonia, or right now in Lithuania, but very close. Um, Deb's research is looking at uh, cinema and uh, adding the gender dimension, and uh, Deb works a lot with uh, different interdisciplinary scholars, uh, starting from network scientists and uh, mathematicians, geospatial scientists, and I'm sure Deb will also introduce her work herself and also the team that we work with. So, but no longer do I give it to Deb, uh, and really excited to have her here. Thanks, Deb. Thanks, Max. Thanks, June. I'm very happy to to be here today, wherever here is. Um, I guess we'll we'll think about that as we talk about some of the ways in which I work with data. I'm going to share my screen if I can. Let's have a look. Okay, you should all be able to see my PowerPoint. Can you thumbs up me? Yes, excellent. Um, I am going to talk about the kinematics group, but the kinematics group, as June said, is quite dispersed and it's dispersed in a number of different ways, not just geographically. We're dispersed by discipline, uh, we're dispersed by um, academic rank. Uh, some members of our team are not even formally academics, um, and that's fine by us. Um, uh, so I wanted to think about that idea of dispersal or diffusion or distribution as it pertains to the work of kinematics, which is uh, a research team that initially began via a common interest in understanding not just the distribution of cultural goods, but an orientation to redistributing cultural goods. So thinking about the methods that we used to study culture, particularly cinema and the music industry, but also think about how that related to or was relevant to ourselves as a research team or as a research group. So what redistributions were, would we learn or acquire through our study of cinema, for example? And that plays, I think, to a number of very important kind of philosophical underpinnings for the group. So if you'll humor me, I just want to go a little left of field for a minute and think philosophically. <coughs> um, and that will, will again weave through the talk. So the talk will be very pragmatic. I'll show you very um, um, small scale and, and larger scale examples of our work, but I also want to always relate them back to some of the kind of philosophical values that underpin the kinematics group. So one of the, the big things for us is how to think about how data and, and big data in the case of some of the work we do can be used to create a more open, diverse, inclusive or ethical society. And that's really the core of it. Um, there's no real point, I think, for any of us in the kinematics group. We're not a funded group in any way. Nobody's paid to work with us or for us. Um, we're all motivated by 
uh, a common interest in our collaboration and the meaning of our collaboration. Why? Why do we do this this work? And and one of those reasons those reasons is that we wish to to kind of use our skills and our collaboration to do more than just use data to describe. We want to use data to diagnose and propose ways to intervene. So it's it's beyond the description. Uh, in a sense, so much of what happens with data is simply counting or enumerating something that exists rather than thinking about what might exist. What happens if we do that, if we move from making our data more open to making data that produces openness? And it's an interesting move to move from arguing for open data to instead arguing for data that produces openness. What does that even mean? And how do you do that in practice? Um, and I want to start by um, taking, in a sense, a good long hard look at myself, because that's where we all start in the kinematics group. Um, we're always interested in what it is that we do uh, from our own vantage, from our own standpoint. And I guess that's a sort of a fundamental feminist position to take, which is this idea that uh, we all have a standpoint and that standpoint, our vantage, our perspective, affects the ways in which we're able to work or, or collaborate. So um, uh, this slide that I've opened on uh, is um, an artwork by Anish Kapoor. It's in the High Art Museum in Atlanta. Uh, it's a headshot, literally, it's a headshot of many versions of my head. Um, and I put it up here, not just because I'm um, well known in my Instagram account for many selfies, um, but I want to start by talking about my disciplinary vantages, my backgrounds in, in digital humanities, in women's and gender studies, as someone who's studied cinema for a very, very long time, and who's been a feminist activist in that space. Uh, and when I see something like this, of course, I'm drawn to my own background in cinema studies. I start to think about all the images I've seen of women looking at themselves in mirrors in the cinema. And there are millions of these that they range from um, films like Lady from Shanghai. Um, I'm sure you've all seen these images. And if you haven't, I guarantee the next time you go and see a film, you will see an image of a woman looking at herself in the mirror. It happens every single time. Um, but I'm also really interested in um, a film like Being John Malkovich, um, a film about a man who literally ends up inside his own head and he can't escape. You know, when you're setting up labs and, and Kudan might be an example of this, certainly kinematics is, you know, what you're striving to do is extend the intellectual capacity of yourself uh, by leaning on and leaning into the skill sets of other people. And that is definitely one strategy for this idea of how to get outside our own heads. How do we engage with and alongside people that aren't the mirror image of ourselves, like you might see in this particular slide? How do we make connections um, personally, but also intellectually, uh, based on who or what we don't already know? Um, and there's a bigger sort of philosophical underpinning to that as well, which is the problem of underneath all of that, how do we take seriously the lives of others? So not at the level of beliefs, you know, I'm aware that other people believe other things and I take that seriously, but at the level of meaning. So how do we do that without just explaining the worlds of others on their behalf? How do we do that by multiplying worlds, by, get, by creating a world, I guess, that um, in a sense means that we can all live our lives as variously as possible? not just us, but other people as well. Um, and so there's, there's some of the kind of big philosophical questions that sit at the heart of the, the kinematics enterprise. Um, this, this interest in getting beyond a superficial interdisciplinarity, I guess, is another way to put it. And one of the ways of, of doing that, of getting beyond the superficial, is to reflect constantly on how those relationships that we create and those relationships that we seek to create change us in the process of being with them. So it's about creating an openness in ourselves, not just producing openness as a product of our, our enterprise. 
I think these are really important questions. I think as we live in a closing down world, very literally at the moment, or a world that should be closing down even more than it possibly currently is um, in some places. How do we respond to and reflect on changing ideas of openness in that world? Um, I think we need to redress these deepening divisions that mark this version of, of humanity in the world. And we can do that by focusing in particular on our capacity for openness and connection. At the political level, at the institutional level, at the technical level, at the social level, at the organisational level, at the environmental level, but also at the personal level. Um, and these, I think, ultimately then are questions about how we handle data and what kind of infrastructure we build to fathom data. And a lot of this comes down, I think, to the question of infrastructure. Labs are a form of intellectual infrastructure. Um, all infrastructure is that which enables the conditions for the possibility of connection. So travel infrastructure is enabling the possibility for connection at the level of travel. Uh, road infrastructure enables the possibility of connection in terms of roads. Um, labs enable the possibility for connection intellectually. Um, so I think if we start to think about what we do as part of these bigger infrastructures that we interoperate in, data infrastructure, university infrastructure, intellectual infrastructure, and so on, it starts to, to give us possibilities for how to generate change and innovation in those spaces. Uh, yeah, I'll try that. Nope. Okay. All right, so one of the ways in which um, I've been reflecting on these questions is through the digital humanities. And a lot of people say to me, what is the digital humanities? You know, it's this fantastic label. No one really knows what it is. Um, I'm not going to give you a neat definition of the digital humanities because um, that would spoil all the fun. Instead, I'm gonna describe the digital humanities in the form of a joke. So how many digital humanities researchers does it take to change a light bulb? You don't have to answer really. Uh, the answer is two, one to change the light bulb and the other one to tell you that you aren't a real digital humanities scholar unless you made the light bulb yourself. And what that tells you about the digital humanities is that the digital humanities is fundamentally collaborative and it's fundamentally about making and doing. That it's about changing the infrastructure or rebuilding infrastructure or creating new infrastructure in order to solve problems. Um, and so you see this really um, all the way through the history of the digital humanities, um, in large part, often because the kinds of tools that the humanities scholars are encouraged to work with are not purpose built to fit the humanities. So there's quite a lot of new work that has to occur in order for the humanities, the people that work in the digital humanities to actually even process the kinds of questions that they're interested in applying to data or the kinds of computational systems that are set up for them to work with data uh, don't tend to work very well in the humanities. So there's, there is a lot of that sense of why, of why the making um, but it's also about an attendance to methodologies, um, which haven't always been well understood in the humanities. That's not necessarily the most rigorous of ways of, of approaching methodology. Um, so digital humanities tends to be a, a new part of the humanities in that it does sit down to try and think through methods and methodology as they pertain to problem solving. Okay, I'm gonna ask the question again. So how many digital humanities researchers does it take to change a light bulb? And the answer is this time, one, um, but, and there's a caveat, no humanities scholar is ever going to trust a single light source. And what that joke tells you is that what we do with the digital humanities is we add to computational studies, the underlying values of humanities research. And that has required us to do, I think a lot of reflecting on what that might be, what might that look like. So, uh, as this, this lovely quote from Edouard Glissant suggests, the humanities is very interested in complexity. And it's something we like to cling to. We think complexity is a good thing, not something that needs to be uh, 
made more efficient. Um, so the simplest explanation is not always for the humanities the best explanation. We're very interested, as I've mentioned, in collaboration. Um, we tend to drive at knowledge through a different process than, than a kind of a hypothesis driven approach, which is we tend to use contestation as a fundamental way to, to push towards knowledge. So that idea that um, Max, you might say A, I'm gonna say B, um, June will come along and say, I'm not sure about either A or B, what if we think about C in this set of circumstances and so on. And that kind of contestation, that process of thesis, antithesis, new thesis, antithesis, and so on is a, a kind of familiar way for us to produce knowledge. And it's often one that um, causes a lot of anxiety and consternation, particularly amongst university administrators who think of us as a very cantankerous lot that can never agree on anything. And I like to also kind of say that that's, that's how we do it. That's the point of how we, we engage in producing new knowledge. It's not a limitation, it's actually what we do. Um, however, that hasn't, I haven't yet ever convinced a university administrator to accept this as, as a good way to work. Um, connectedness is very important. Um, following trails of relationships through those connections and connections for the, in the humanities are not always logical. We're not always interested in logical connections. Um, so serendipity is very important in the humanities as a way of producing new knowledge, for example, um, as a form of non-logical um, connectivity. Um, I like to, to show this visualization as a way of sort of trying to think about how we do the humanities. Um, so the, the visualizations in the middle are gaping void visualizations and on the outside of mine. Um, and so you have this picture of humanities knowledge, which is a, a non-hierarchical graph um, where the edges or the, the connections between nodes are um, different thicknesses, different colors, they have different flavors, they have different viscosity, um, they're not regulated. There's no sort of one size fits all idea that, that should encompass all forms of humanities knowledge and, and explain everything in a similar way. Um, so this is, this is sort of where we come from in the in the humanities so you know not it's not about the only measure of value being efficiency for example um while we're reflecting on on intellectual infrastructure i want to tell just a, a quick anecdote about a visit i had recently to the maritime museum in amsterdam uh, and i went to uh the top level of, of one of the, the buildings in the, the museum. And it was talking a bit about the kind of four key questions that defined the spectacular success of Dutch shipping infrastructure. So a much earlier version of, of infrastructure that they were attempting to understand in this museum exhibit. And they said there were four, four questions. And I think those same four questions apply to almost all forms of infrastructure in, in one way or another. And we can start to think about how they might apply, apply to data infrastructure and the way we approach data. So the first, uh, the first question is, where am I now? And the question, where am I now? I think for the purposes of what I want to talk about today is really a question largely about time. How do we understand temporality or time in data? Uh, the next question is, where am I going? Which is the space question. The third question that you had to be able to answer for Dutch shipping infrastructure to not just succeed, but absolutely take over the world was, what is my speed? So velocity. And I think in big data, we've talked quite a bit about understanding velocity. The fourth one, and this is the one that interests me the most, and this is the one I think that the humanities really lends uniquely to the problem of how we do data and how we understand and work with data. And that is the question, what is my depth? Because it's a question that, that asks us to think about what lies beneath our feet. What provides the underlying conditions for meaning and understanding? I talked a little bit earlier about how we all have a standpoint. You know, what is that standpoint? How do we reflect on that? What came before us? What set the context 
for where we are in a sense. And of course, the way in which the Dutch measured depth was uh, in relation to fathoms. Fathom, the word itself, has a really interesting relationship to what we're trying to do in the digital humanities. So the word fathom is a, a measurement that has also come to mean the ability to understand something. What is the unfathomable? How do we fathom something? Um, it's from a word that means in Old English, I think, two arms outstretched. In fact, I can't get far back enough on my screen to do it, which is about six feet. Not in my case, I'm much shorter than that. But um, it's a measurement based on a human scale. To fathom is to have something within your grasp. To be able to grasp something in English as well means to understand it. Um, it makes a, a leap, I guess, a metaphorical leap from a, a maritime measurement to describing concepts that we're able to get our arms around, that we're able to kind of touch. And if you think about how far we sit from our computer screens, generally it's about an arm's length. Everyone now reaches out to touch their computer screen. Um, I think this concept of depth is the one that you'll find I'm going to talk about for the next little part of this, this presentation, um, because it is something that that the humanities brings. And it may not always be completely obvious as I'm speaking, but it should sit there, as I say, literally underneath our feet uh, as we, we talk. Um, and I think the other thing to, to think of is in this context is that I'm not, you know, when I'm talking about data, interested particularly in volume, which seems to be the thing everyone wants to talk about, you know, big data. It's, it's in the name itself. Um, it's this obsession with size. Um, not my interest at all, and, and we'll get to that in a sec. Okay, so this is now where kinematics sort of fits in. Um, you can visit the kinematics website if any of this is of any interest to you. Um, you can rummage around in there and there's, there's about um, nearly 10, actually more than 10 years worth of, of projects sitting inside that data set. So I'm not gonna talk about all of those projects today because you would be, um, board off your brains and not just that, I would get very hungry. So um, what do we do in, in, well, I've lost my headers on my slides, but that's okay. Um, this is um, a, a visual representation of one of the, the kind of major data sets that we work with in the kinematics team. And it's the kinematics showtime data set. And it describes about 350 million show times um, across, I'm going to say 51 countries. There's some debate about how many of those countries are actually countries. And of course that changes all the time. So let's just say 51 countries, but, um, and that data describes um, show times collected some years ago now, although we have been recollecting similar data, which covers the entire COVID period. So we're about to start work on that. Um, so as you can imagine, the, the number of um, data points in the collection will have risen quite dramatically. Is 350 million show times big? Is this big data? I don't know, it was, it sort of felt big at the time, but I guess if I was an astronomer, it would be kind of tiny and it's probably, much smaller now than it felt in 2012 when we started collecting it. I think we're kind of approaching big data the wrong way. Big data for me is a collection of data that in any given context is so large, it's ungraspable using conventional approaches to analysis. Okay, so that's a, a very contingent way of describing big data. Big data is data that's at the time you sit before it is ungraspable using the techniques you have to hand. I think therefore we need to focus on something slightly different in the way we talk about big data. If your data hasn't caused you to consider or to reconsider your place in the world, it probably isn't big data. If your data hasn't caused you to have an existential crisis, it probably isn't big data. 
okay? If it's not drawing attention to what your limitations are, if it's not causing you to think about how you can't do it all, then it's not big data. And I'll give you a good example of, of this. So this is really about perspective and standpoint rather than a definition of volume that defines big data in some way. The UN collected data on forcible displacements around the world. And in 2016, they reported that 65.3 million people were forcibly displaced. And they tried, that's a very big number. They tried to help people make sense of that. So they said that's 24 people forcibly displaced every minute, which is about two people every time you breathe. If when you hear that, you find it hard to breathe, if it causes you to catch your breath, then I think you've understood this as big data. If you sit there kind of going, well, two into 24 is 12, which means I take 12 breaths every minute and so on. If that's the way you approach the problem, then you're treating it as a factoid, as a kind of a manageable piece of small data. It's the same number. It's all in how you approach it and how you understand your relationship to that, to that data. Big data isn't interesting because it's big. It's interesting because it's monumentally detailed and it's infinitely interconnected and it implicates us. It has ramifications for us. Small data brings the world within reach. Big data stretches you to recognizing what you can't grasp. It takes you beyond your horizons. It has epistemic implications because it pushes at the edges of what we can know and how we can know it. And it has ontological implications because we need help, particularly from machines, rather than just human-centered methods to work with it. You can't work with big data without yourself leaning into the interconnected world. You can't work with big data without recognizing that your disciplinary outlook is in every aspect touching some other. It's not how big your data is, it's what you do with it that counts. That was really for the Zoom bomber, but you know, they've gone. So anyway, <laughs> um, so then who is kinematics? So kinematics is for that very reason made up of people from a broad range of disciplines and outlooks. Um, we, work in very fluid ways. As I mentioned earlier, we're not a paid lab. We're not there because someone's giving us a salary to sit together. Um, we work on things out of interest. Um, people move in and out of the network um, depending on what's going on for them in their worlds and whether we have interesting projects for them to work on. Um, so uh, Colin Arrowsmith, who's um, I'm gonna talk a little, little bit about in the next few minutes is a um, geospatial scientist. Stuart was a network engineer. Bronwyn is a cultural economist. Ben is a, um, a very highly regarded and somewhat incendiary journal journalist with about 60,000 followers in Twitter, but he's also a cultural policy expert. Um, Sarah Taylor is a kind of genius. It's very hard to describe what she is. She's a polymath and does pretty much everything. And I don't even want to diminish her in any way by trying to come up with some explanation of what she can do because she's amazing. Alwyn Davidson is a cartographer. Uh, Amanda Coles is a labor economics specialist. Um, you probably know June as well as I do, so I don't need to say much about June either. Um, Kaska um, Muzial Gabris is a um, network engineer in Sydney. Uh, Scotty Loist is a film specialist who works in particular on data pertaining to uh, film festivals. Uh, Elizabeth Prommer is one of the top 100 most influential women in Germany, as according to a magazine article last week. Um, and she's a, a media studies specialist and a sociologist. Uh, Paul Moore is a film historian based in Canada. 
Lachlan Simpson um, is someone who was so inspired by a kinematics event that he went away and started crunching data for us voluntarily and, um, and ended up helping us so, uh, unlock or solve a very interesting problem, which I'll show you a little later. And Michelle Mancio is an artist um, who also happens to speak Greek and helped work with us on a, a particular project that was looking at Greek cinema. Um, so, you know, we're an interesting bunch and there's not a lot of similarity between us, although um, there, there are some obvious ones as well, um, which we can also talk about later. Um, we work on a, a broad range of projects. Um, so here are just a, a sort of a sample of some of them. Um, and many thanks to June for designing this infographic. Um, this really describes the Showtime database and the other major database we worked with, which is a, a gig, a, a sort of summary of music industry gigs of metadata of where bands played and, and when, um, which we also did some quite interesting work with. All right, so where we started and I think what kind of set us off on the most interesting journey was actually some small data, not, not big data at all. And it was data about a series of film screenings and, and cinemas in Melbourne, Australia that were established by the Greek and Italian migrant communities that came to Australia in the 1950s, 60s and 70s. And we were very interested, we did a sort of very, um, it was a four year project investigating those cinemas and interviewing the people associated with them and and trying to kind of recreate some sense of, of what was going on in that period and why Greek cinema in particular was so popular in Melbourne. So um, I thought when I first started this project, I was going to be dealing with maybe a handful of cinemas. There were actually 35 Greek cinemas in Melbourne in the post-war period. Um, it was huge and, and Melbourne, it's not widely known, but Melbourne is or was for some time the second largest Greek city in the world. So it's quite an, quite an impressive achievement and almost unheard of by people who were outside that community and yet quite significant. Um, and so when we were interviewing the guys who ran that circuit, those circuits, um, they gave us lots of information, but some of the information didn't seem to stack up against um, other interviews that we un undertook. And we, we often turn to the data to try and clarify things to work out who was, who was actually telling us the truth or, or who was telling us something that more closely resembled what actually happened. Um, so one of the first things we did is we mapped the cinemas according to census data on migration. And what you can see in this visualization is um, each census year, 1956, 61, 66, and 71, the location of the cinemas, which are the black dots, and a, a sort of scale looking at the percentage of Greek population in suburban areas. The darker the purple, the more Greeks in the area. So anyway, it doesn't tell us a lot. Um, it looks pretty, but wasn't that interesting. So what we decided to do was actually animate the data. And this is what the animation looked like. This is a, we did this about 15 years ago. So I sort of apologize for the simplicity of a lot of the data visualizations compared to what you can do now with a package, but this was all, you know, hand coded. So now I've watched this visualization about 600 times. So I'm gonna um, cut to the chase because I'm sure there are more exciting projects to get on with. Um, what you can see here is something very interesting, which is that the cinemas preempt community migration. So it's a case of if you build it, they will come, which is counterintuitive. What you would expect is for a Greek population to exist and then be serviced by a cinema. By animating the data, we were actually able to produce something that we couldn't see just in a, a static snapshot of the data itself. Um, and I think uh, what this suggests is really interesting in relation to cultural amenity and how we understand the relationship of cultural infrastructure like cinemas and populations. 
and their relationship. Um, so in dwelling on cinema as an infrastructure, we were also able to kind of think about these other reversals in terms of connection that we've been trying to, to philosophically understand throughout the kinematics enterprise. Uh, this is just a, um, a slightly more recent visualization of the global data where we, um, I'll just put this up for fun. Uh, this is uh, looking at the relative concentration of screenings of comedies around the world. So where there's a peak, it turns into topography. Where you see a mountain peak, that means that there's a lot of comedies screening in relation to other genres, more than you would expect. And when you see a trough or a valley, it's because there's less. Um, so this is, this is a snapshot of data taken just pre-Brexit, I think. So I'm just going to pause there. Um, and so you see um, in Southern Europe, um, quite a lot of laughing happening and not much laughter happening over in Britain. Um, I maintain this is definitely a pre-Brexit kind of understanding of, of cinema topography. There's the US. Again, you can see who's laughing and who's not. Okay. Um, moving on kind of quickly, because I want to get to the second half of the lecture, and I also want to have a little break so that we all don't have to stare at the screen for so long. Um, we were interested in this, uh, having done this animation, in how you think about that relationship between space, time, and change, change over time, um, and how you might do that, but in a non-animation setting. So uh, one of the researchers working with us, Alwyn Davidson, the cartographer, uh, spent quite a lot of time taking, a, again, a reasonably small data set, but trying to do something very creative with it, which is to think about how to capture multivariate data in a single snapshot. And she came up with these visualizations, which I think are quite beautiful. Um, so what this visualization describes is um, cinema survival in post-war Melbourne based on a number of different variables. And if you have the, the key to the, the visualization, you can see what the variables mean. So um, the, the lines coming out from the center are time. So cinemas that survive the longest push furthest out to the edge of the, the circle. Um, cinemas that didn't survive, you'll see loop, the loop closes on the lines very uh, close to the center. One of the things that Owen understood in looking at the data around closures of cinemas in Melbourne is that um, street address or uh, GPS location or Latin long were not relevant to what she was trying to comprehend or understand. So rather than just use a Google map, which is what everyone defaults to when they're looking at spatial data, um, she examined the data and determined that in fact the most uh, important part of the location was the cardinal points. So the cinemas in the north are on the north axis of this visualization, cinemas in the east are on the east axis, axis and so on. And immediately what you can see from this is that cinemas in the north suffered enormous loss over that post-war period. There's very little cultural amenity for cinemas in the west and so on. You can, see, you can get quite a lot of information from this just by quickly glancing at it. Um, I think this is really exciting, this work, because what it does is it, it asks us to think about um, mapping and visualizations as more than tools to throw information at. It asks us to rethink the map, to rethink the visualization tool to suit the data, um, and to think about what it is you're trying to solve in relation to the data. So this particular study really focused on the complexities of complexities of the data and how to preserve the complexities, um, how to think about spatial and temporal characteristics in relation to change over time. Um, so not to use an existing tool, but to create a new visualization technique to understand the problem better. Um, so these are just some of the ways in which she used that same technique in relation to different data. In this, in this particular one, you can see that um, if you're a Hoyt cinema and you made no changes to your business, and I can I know this because I've looked at this 
um, many times you had and you were within five kilometers of the CBD the central business district you were a hundred percent likely to die in the post-war period so just simple things like that um, this visualization really throws up quite quite nicely um, another just quick project to run through is this one where we were trying to understand a problem in um, our interviews with the, the key players in this project. They kept telling us, you know, that they were just cinephiles, they loved movies, they would just show whatever was the greatest movie and they didn't care where it showed, they could show it everywhere. There was no pattern to how they programmed their cinemas. It was all just wonderful and lovely. And then we would get audience members, particularly Macedonians saying to us, uh, they just gave us the crap films. They were terrible. You know, the really good films always showed at other venues miles away from where we lived. And we could never get to the bottom of it. So we thought we're going to use the data to try and figure out what happened to, to the patterns of distribution inside this circuit. And we decided to use Markov trees as the, the technique for doing this. Um, which was sort of interesting. So, you know, for those of you familiar with how to do Markov chain analysis, you, we coded the, the theatres, um, we named all the chains um, via the, the kind of venue codes, and we tested two different types of films. One type of film was distributed, or sorry, made by a production company called Anzervos, and they were like cheap, nasty melodramas, black and white, came out, you know, were many of them, they were kind of produced very quickly, um, not a lot of um, quality control going on in that studio. Finos films were the big budget musicals, they took ages to make, they, they came slowly um, from one to the next, um, and they were expensive to distribute because the, the um, Greek distributors would ask for more money for these films to come out to Australia. So Anzervos cheap, Finos expensive. May I ask a clarifying question? Yes. What are the nodes in the in the in the Markov chain? So so is it the cinemas that the movie yes. is consecutively shown in? Or yes. So okay. you'll see these are these are cine this is following cinemas, sorry, films through different cinemas. Okay. So okay. these are Anzervos films on the mm -hmm. left. Um, and they've all been given a number, you know, um, film two one three seven, film two one five one, and so on. And then you'll see those films and follow them through each chain. Um, and the chains, which are the alphabetical letters of the cinemas. Thank you. Um, so that's, that's Anservos. And this is just a quick section, just to give you, Max, a little bit more clarity on, on how that works. And here are the Phenos films. And here is a little bit more clarity. Now, one of the interesting things about cinema is um, and where it doesn't really work to use Markov chains is Markov chains don't really care about the, the temporal lag between each screening. It's just tracking generations and each generation, as far as the Markov chain is concerned, is an equal distribution. But in cinema, it does make a really big difference. If a film is screened uh, every day for a week, that's interesting. If it then lapses for two years and then screens again, that tells us a lot about that particular film. It's a repertory screening if it screens two years later, not a, a first release screening or, or whatever. So we sat down to look at this and I asked Michelle, who was working with us at the time, um, if she could imagine re-visualizing the Markov chain so it expressed something much more specific to this particular case study. And so she reimagined the Markov trees as actual trees. So these trees are olive trees. They're actually representations of Markov distributions, but with time added. So the length, length of each branch and the distance between the leaves is the amount of time that's lapsed between screenings. So this is a comparison of Anzervos films and Phenos films that started their distribution at the Melbourne Town Hall, which was a very big and expensive venue to hire. It had an enormous number of seats, I think something like 5,000 seats. And as you can see, the Anzervos films were not screened much at the Melbourne Town Hall. It's a scraggly little olive tree without much going on. Whereas the Phenos films proliferated and flourished if they started at the Melbourne Town Hall. 
This makes a lot of sense because the Finos films were expensive. You wanted to sell a lot of tickets. So you needed a big venue with lots of seats and Zervos films didn't attract the same demand in, in audience. And so they tended not to do very well if they started at the, the Melbourne Town Hall. This is the Doncaster Theatre, which was um, a suburban theatre, much closer to a working class audience um, and possibly one that included a lot more Macedonians. And you can see here that the Anzervos films in fact did a lot better than the Finos films. You have these very long branches in between the Finos films, which they, they weren't really screening much at the, the Doncaster Theatre. That's just a, a close up. This is um, a, an Anzervos tree with a number of different films on it. So when Michelle um, produced these visualizations, she talked a lot about how she herself as a young child had been to see films, Greek films in some of these cinemas. And she drew on her memory of some of the advertising slides like this one, which was shown at the screenings that she went to and childhood books that she saw as well um, at the time. And she talks about how when she came up with those visualizations, she was very interested in remembering how the film screenings felt to her. That's part of what she was trying to capture in the visualization is that feeling of being at those screenings and seeing those films. And it reminded me a lot of this poetic quotation from Alfred Korn, where he says, the idea hard to get in focus is not how things looked, but how the look felt then and then now. So he's asking us to imagine not just the, the feeling of something as a memory, but the feeling of something as history, as having an experience that carries across time, perhaps differently or contingently. And I think this is really interesting because he's asking us to think about our own inner life as a witness when we, when we come to these um, events that we're attempting to describe with data. And when we look at data itself, we're looking at that, that distinction between when the data was and when our engagement with the data is as two things. And there's a dual feeling that we have to try and come to the feeling of what the data captures and the feeling of our engagement with the data and what it captures, if that makes sense. And to, uh, in that sense, think about these underlying algorithms of feeling that also occur with the way we approach data. How's everyone going? It's sort of, I've got a little bit more to say, but I know also that we've now been sitting still for a long time. Should we have a stretch? Always. If, Always. I'm about to get to part two <laughs> of the talk. Uh, we're we're not right. trained in two hours. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're doing better than me. I find I'm, I'm like, you know, 45 minutes tends to be about my limit in anything in, in life anymore. But... Okay. <laughs> if you'd like to oh, have we... a break, we can do a break. So. No, no. We're going for epic movie length now, not short films. Okay, good. Epic, epic movie, <laughs> movies. We have a, a cinema here that um, you can buy wine and go to the cinema. And when you order the wine, they ask you, do you want short film, feature film or epic? <laughs> and, there's, and there's a line on the glass according to which one you want. I always go the epic, um, which probably just tells you more about my alcoholism than anything else. But okay, I want to get back to this idea of depth, right? Which I which I keep circling around because I do think this is the thing that the humanities brings to the discussion around data. Um, and I want to get back to this idea of looking and feeling. So this is a a picture of me looking at a Turner painting. And it's a very, very powerful painting. It's one of my um, all, all time favorite paintings. I'm, if I'm ever in London, I will go and see this, like I sort of worship this painting in, in a particular way. And it's a, a painting by Turner, if, if anyone has studied art or knows about art. And it depicts a specific event and it's an event that a horrified Turner and he painted this very late in life and it's an unfinished painting and it's probably an unfinished painting because I don't think he knew what to do with 
his own feelings about the event he's depicting, let alone how we then look at his depiction of that event. So getting that layering back in again. And it depicts the wreck of a convict ship headed to Australia in 1833, a ship called the Amphitrite. On that ship were 108 women and 12 children and 13 crew, all of whom lost their lives when the ship ran aground off the coast of France. The reason it's a particularly controversial event is because the captain, a man called John Hunter, was offered assistance by the French who saw the ship just offshore and he refused their rescue offers. And he refused them because he said that his charter was to deliver these wretched people to Australia and if he wasn't able to do that, then he no longer had responsibility for them and effectively they could just die. So they drowned. And I think there's a lot about this painting that for me resonates with a very contemporary global callousness in the face of desperation at sea. Um, and we've had years now of watching uh, refugee crises in Australia in particular, but also in Europe that's involved this kind of desperation. There's a sense of Turner here dwelling on the sub in sublime and how without a fixed horizon, we can only reflect on our shifting proximity to depth and perhaps oblivion and how for so many of us, that's a terrifying calculation. The ship also in a sense here stands in for a craft in English ship and craft are interchangeable words. And here we have also the craft of the painter and the craft of representation. And for Turner, representation has effectively collapsed in this picture. He, he spent 30 years as a professor of perspective. And here we have a painting where there is no horizon, there's no perspective. So what happens when representation itself collapses, when, when we don't have a purpose perspectival or a moral anchor anymore? I think you know, Turner is sort of asking what or where is the point? Where do we draw the line? He's asking us to, to think about that because he's not offering it. Um, the challenge here is to find perception in, in the incoherence, the moral incoherence, but also the representative incoherence of what he's, he's painting. So he's drawing you in from a very specific to a more, much more generalized existential crisis not dissimilar to the one I was talking about before. How do we address our own disorientations and entanglements as a relationship between what we do and what is done to us? How are we ourselves rendered both visible and invisible in multiple ways? In a sense, he's asking us here, look, you know, here's the, what happens when the captain looks away and when the painter looks and cares. So where does that put us? When we look at this, we're also, in a sense, we're going to walk away unless we enable it or allow it to change us in some way. It reminds me a little bit, there's an Auden poem where he talks about um, suffering is a kind of distraught loneliness. And, and I think Turner is getting at that in some way. Um, Hans Bloomberg, who, who actually wrote a book called Shipwreck with Spectator, proposes that the spectator who witnesses distress at sea is actually the definition of theory. That theorists, in a sense, are witnessing something beyond their arm's length. Um, but I think Turner is doing a little bit more than that because he's asking, he's sort of seeking to implicate us ethically in the problem he's painting. And I, I like how, in a sense, uh, even though Turner doesn't turn away, um, the image contains within it, I keep pointing at my screen, I should do it here. Um, the image also includes a visual turning, that the image kind of turns itself, which is, is also quite interesting to me. Um, I walked out of that gallery and I saw another Turner. So that's probably, see, most of you probably don't even know that that's Tina Turner. But there she is. One good Turner deserves another. Okay. Um, what Turner's dealing with here in, in the visual arts sense is 
kind of interesting to me because this was a huge problem in 19th century England is the problem of shipwrecks. And there were two very interesting open data initiatives that, that set off to try and deal with that very problem. Um, and they're both reasonably well known. The first is um, Robert Fitzroy, this guy, who set out to redress the belief that the weather was innately chaotic and that you, we could actually understand the weather with data. Uh, and he is the guy who gave us the word forecast, right? So he's the, the first official director of the meteorological office in London. Um, and uh, following a series of incredibly uh, distressing, disastrous ship sinkings, uh, he was given authority to begin issuing storm warnings based on the collection of weather data. Uh, and he did this also by interacting with a very new uh, uh, and different form of infrastructure, which was the electric telegraph. So between his data collection and the telegraph, um, which was at the time believed to be com completely bewildering, no one really understood how it worked, um, he was able to issue these storm warnings and forecasts and prevent enormous amounts of loss of life. I'm very interested in what Fitzroy did because I'm kind of interested in the sense of how we work with our data, what we might do to anticipate using data change change that's necessary or change that's required. And I particularly mean change in relation to the things I'm interested in, like equity and just social justice. So can we use data to predict the need for intervention? It's an interesting question. The second guy is this guy, Samuel Plimsoll. Um, he's a, a fascinating person. He was a, a member of parliament um, who was very, um, supportive of the rights of the men who worked on ships. And so uh, he was very distressed by what had become an increasing trend at the time in England where ship owners would deliberately sink their ships to collect the insurance money. And they would do that with people on board. Like they would just overload them, send them down the Thames and wait for them to sink off the coast of England and then cash in. Um, it was this really disgusting um, capitalist enterprise, you know, where uh, very rich men, all of them, or most of them members of parliament. So there's a kind of an, a big network of rich ship owners who also controlled the, the kind of politics of the day, um, exploiting the poor who often worked on the ships um, in order to increase their wealth. So he published a work in 1872 called and this is a gift to all feminists. And I again apologize to the Zoom bomber who missed this highlight. He published a book called Our Seamen. Our Seamen <laughs> is a really interesting book because it's a, um, a culmination of years and years and years of work that he did gathering data in order to try and ensure that overloaded ships would no longer be allowed to set sail. Um, and he gave um, rise to what we now know of as the Plimsoll line, which is this line on the side of ships. And if the water is above the line, then it's overloaded. If it's below the line, then there's not enough ballast. Um, and it's based on quite, for the time, I think quite complex calculations around the salinity of water, the shape of the hull, the type of ship it is, you know, all sorts of different kind of variables that had to go into um, into account or to be taken into account. And in a sense, I guess, um, in the contemporary climate crisis, this might be difficult to understand. Uh, Plimsoll was someone who really believed a rising tide should lift all ships. So it was for him a social justice enterprise. It wasn't just about the ships themselves. He was doing this to save the lives and the, the standards of living of what were at the time very vulnerable people who tended to be the last people to decide whether or not they got to get off the boat. Um, and so uh, in a sense, what I'm interested in here is, um, is there a sense of a usefulness of the Plimsoll line in how we understand some of the aggregate data we work with? And I'll get to that through the next example. Uh, another way to put that is, um, can we think of the inverse? Can we think of um, 
removing the plimsoll line protections in order to sink certain types of ships. And I'm thinking here of SS Patriarchy. But I, I get ahead of myself. Okay, um, this is a an image on the left of me in 1988 at a protest. I'm the one in the glasses with the very unattractive leggings standing up next to the person with the megaphone. Um, and this is a, an image of me protesting something very specific to do with the film industry, which was the closure of the Women's Film Fund, a sp special fund set up in Australia in the 1980s to try and help women access the film industry because it had been recognised that women were um, grossly underrepresented in film labour positions. Um, however, by 1988, the government had decided that they had put enough money into that initiative and were um, determined to, to switch the initiative off. And we, we set out to protest it. The image on the right is just a film poster that um, describes an event I organised called Film Fatale. And I just put that up because I wanted you to know, to know that not all feminists were really bad designers, like you can see on the left. Um, so that's just, and that's Ronald Reagan and that's Patricia Neal with her hand over his face, um, which at the time was kind of topical. Okay, so in 19... 88, that's what I was doing. So I've been an activist in the film industry for a very long time. In 2016, so fast forward nearly 30 years, I'm sitting at my desk looking at my email and in comes an email from the same organisation responsible for the Women's Film Fund. They've changed names. It's the same organisation, Screen Australia. And they were releasing data outlining the percentage of women in key creative roles in the Australian film industry. And I opened it, not expecting anything particularly good to happen, but you know, whatever. I'm, I'm a doomsday, I'm a doom scroller. I opened the email and not only was the data bad, which it was, the participation rates for women were terrible. It was stunningly bad. And it was stunningly bad because the statistics were worse than when I started my activism in the film industry 30 years earlier. So over a 30 year period, the participation rates for women had just not, that, that it's not that they hadn't improved, they'd gotten worse. And I had one of those searing, mind blowingly angry, I think, moments. I call it like a, you know, a sort of searing midlife crisis moment where I was so incandescent with rage and despair because I felt I'd failed at the one job I'd set out to do, which is improve the lives of women in the film industry. And I know it wasn't my personal fault. I kind of do get that, but midlife crises are always about hubris. So at that particular moment, it really did feel like it was my personal responsibility and I had somehow stuffed it up. And several things occurred to me all at the same time. The first was I didn't want to release the data yet again because and I, you know, every time you release data like that, you make women in particular think there's no chance that this is just somehow natural. 30 years of bad data, you know, maybe that's just what that industry is. Maybe it's always going to be like that. Um, and it occurred to me by not releasing it, by withholding the data, um, that I was also then acknowledging that data itself has a kind of power. That every time we release that data, it does that. And it also occurred to me at the same time that we must, you know, there must be something we're looking at from the wrong perspective, from the wrong vantage. And it occurred to me that we needed new approaches after 30 years of policy experimentation, none of which had worked, right? So what were we looking at incorrectly? What, what was going wrong there with the data we were looking at? And I realized, of course, that the problem was that by gathering data on women's participation rates, we were implying that women were somehow the source of the problem. We weren't looking at the beneficiaries of the persistence of systemic domination. 
We weren't looking at who benefited. Who benefits from 30 years of domination? It wasn't women. And yet we kept collecting data about them. What would happen if we flipped it and started to look at the behaviors of the beneficiaries of the system and work out how to change those behaviors rather than expecting women to change their behaviors? Women who are not in a position to create change. Instead of asking women to lean in or get more development or go back to school or be mentored or, you know, and, and so on and so on and so on. Rather than coming up with policies for women, why weren't we coming up with policies for men to change their behavior? Because they were the ones that needed to change and they were the ones in the position to create change. So what I then thought I should do is collect data on men in the industry. So this is a visualization of the Australian film industry over 10 years between 2006 and 2015. Source nodes are producers because they make the decisions on who gets employed. Everyone in here is either a producer, a writer or a director. These are the key creative roles in the film industry. Red is men and blue is women. And the big knot in the middle, ironically, is a film called The Turning. <laughs> and The Turning um, is a portmanteau film. So it's a, it's a tight knot because it's a, a big film made up of a number of small films. So there's an enormous number of people all working closely together on that particular production. So one of the strategies that Screen Australia wanted to experiment with around the time that they released this very, very, very bad data is the idea that women should work with women. They thought this would actually solve the problem somehow. If you look at this visualization, you'll see um, pretty clearly that there's lots of groups of men only. These are men who only work with men. There's another one there. There's a lot up here. There's a lot here and so on. Um, and what we discovered in just statistically examining this network, that of the 218 producers who were men in this diagram, 89 did not work with a single woman in a 10 year period. Average team size of four. That's a shade under or around 41% of all male producers working in a 10 year period in the industry didn't work with a single woman. Men who worked with a token woman Right, that's one woman over the entire 10 years, 75%. Okay, 75%, three quarters of male producers in the Australian film industry over 10 years worked with a woman once. How often was she a director, a film director? Okay, once and she came from France and was brought in by the French distribution company. The solution then wouldn't be to get women to work with women, would it? The solution would be to get men to work with women, maybe. That would be the immediate solution you might grab from something like that. Okay, so I'm looking at this data and I think to myself, this is not enough for me just to describe this situation, I really need to figure out how to intervene and intervene more meaningfully than to make women change their behaviors. How do I intervene in this? Who does that? The answer is police and counter-terrorism agencies. Police and counter-terrorism agencies take this kind of data and they identify the key players when they're looking at the mafia or drug cartels or terrorist cell networks. They look at key players and then they take them out. What would that look like in the Australian film industry? What if we just stopped funding men who don't work with women? Maybe that's a solution. I don't know. These are the men who don't work with women in the Australian film industry. I call them the gender offenders because it's in honor of criminal network analysis, which is the technique I'm using. So these are the gender offenders of the Australian film industry. And the great thing is I know that guy's name. I know that guy's name. He's like the jackal. He's sort of 
he does work with women occasionally. He's worked with one woman once. I know that guy's name. I know all their names. We could actually stop funding them tomorrow. Wouldn't cost anything. You wouldn't have to set up a program. You wouldn't have to administer any funding. You just stop funding them. Why don't we do that? I don't know. That's the German film industry. That's the German gender offenders. That's the Swedish film industry. That's the Swedish gender offenders. This is Australian academic research funding. Red is men. I cried when I saw this visualization the first time. That's me. I call that my data selfie. Right on the edge. These are the men in the Australian research funding scheme that I analyzed that don't work with women. Average team size of 12. It takes a lot of effort to avoid working with a woman with an average team size of 12. You may think patriarchy looks like that. You may think patriarchy looks like that. Patriarchy also looks like this. What this data exercise asks is what does it mean to give weight and shape to relationships? Can we recognize the quality of relationships by their shape? And if the answer is yes, or even maybe, then what are the implications of that for how we understand ourselves and how we might redress the uneven patterns of interaction and coexistence that shape our day-to-day -day lives? What if we could see the contours of injustice? What if our visualizations could uncover and bring into sight structures of domination between people within organizations, for example? What if that happened and we no longer had to notarize the vestiges of trauma to admit its existence? What if we didn't have to wait for people to suffer, to leave, to be ill, to you know, all the disastrous effects that this has on the lives of individuals. What if we didn't have to wait for that to be apparent? What if we didn't have to wait for people to declare me too in order to admit the existence of the problem? What if women and other minorities no longer had to prove evidence of the discriminations perpetrated against them until after they occurred? What if we could use data to do that? How would that approach lead us to understand seemingly intractable inequality as systemic and individual and political and personal? Just quickly running through the aggregates. Between the three countries, you see this very interesting set of patterns. We actually had to run the data many times because we were so worried that we were somehow um, not looking at it equitably or that we'd somehow confused the underlying data. But the percentage of male producers who work with no women on the creative team is more or less the same across all three industries, as is the percentage of male producers who work with zero to one. And this started me thinking about whether in fact there's a Plimsoll line for patriarchy. Is there a kind of comfort zone where patriarchy feels okay statistically? And anything beyond or above that is sort of the wrong ballast. Also kind of similar. These are the funding programs that we analyzed and you'll see also quite interesting similarity in the statistics, the total leads for each of the research teams. These are um, linkage infrastructure grants and these are National Health and Medical Research Council grants. Sort of sits around the same. The number of projects with equitable or better numbers of women for both programs was 4%. And these are the names of the men that tended to get funded. And you'll see David very prominently positioned at the top there. 
Uh, interestingly, though, the most lucratively funded name, the name that gets the most money, as opposed to the name that's most commonly funded, is, and again, where's our Zoom bomber? It's Richard, also known as in English as Dick. So, you know, do we have a diversity problem in research funding? No, we do not have a diversity problem in research. <laughs> diversity is never the problem. We have a diversity problem. Too many Davids are being funded and we need to stop this and we can use data to do it. Okay, so do we have a Plimsoll line problem? Um, actually, that was an interesting one and it led us down the path to really thinking more deeply about the underlying operations of networks. And um, I won't bore you with all the detail because I'm, I wanna finish up so you've got time for questions. But if you look here at the different countries and different var variables inside the networks like modularity or assortativity, you'll see that there is in fact quite interesting disparities between the networks. So although the aggregate statistics look very similar, so at the aggregate statistical level, you might think my patriarchy is the same as your patriarchy, is the same as their patriarchy and so on. Actually under the hood, if you lift the hood up and look at the engine driving the relationships, there are very, very different characteristics in the networks. And consequently, the kinds of strategies that you would need to intervene in those networks would differ. Um, and there's a kind of nuance there. So here, for example, is my attempt to model what would happen if I took out all the gender offenders in the Australian screen industry? What would happen? Would it produce more openness in the network? Would it, would it enable the network to be more open to vari variation to minorities, for example? So um, in this particular version, we took the men out successively, one at a time. Um, although we did other strategies later in different models. How many men, how many gender offenders will we have to take out of the network in order to, to change the network? And the answer is pretty much all of them because the network in Australia is highly modular. So if you take Harvey Weinstein and throw him off SS patriarchy, someone else will just come up and keep steering the ship and it'll probably go a bit faster because you've lost a bit of ballast. So it doesn't work just to take the men out. Um, I'm not going to bore you with this next example. I'm just going to whiz through it. This is, um, we also did similar analysis of board networks in corporate um, companies. Uh, so one of the things we are able to do is um, build a tool to help us continue to do this modeling. And so we've built this tool called Widget, which is the Workplace Inclusion Diversity Gender Equity Tool. Um, and that's going to enable us to do hypothetical modeling or what if scenarios. Um, and it will also enable us to test different policy interventions on networks to see how effective they might be. So just to finish up, I wanna think about the difference between counting and being accountable, which I think is sort of coming full circle on where we started in the talk. The response to the kind of data that I've been showing you in the screen industry has not been especially warm or welcoming, funnily enough. So the main screen agency in Australia, the, the Screen Australia, uh, is very upset at the analysis we've been doing. And they uh, claim that because the aggregate statistics show an improvement for the number of women getting key creative credits, um, we've been able to demonstrate that that's actually happened as a result of gaming the funding system. Um, and producers will always follow the money. That's what their job is. They're very good at reading the loopholes in any funding si situation or system. And they've done that very effectively using some of the incentives that were created to encourage more women into the industry. Um, by stacking women in positions of little to no consequence in their creative teams, um, thereby triggering lots of funding, but not actually producing meaningful change in the industry. And when we pointed that out, um, this, is, this guy is the Chief Communications Officer for Screen Australia. Um, and he got very upset and started tweeting about how awful kinematics were. Um, so it's always good to see that you're producing a reaction. I think that that's evidence that you're actually having an impact of some kind. Um, 
This is their, in response to one of the articles that we wrote, this is what they put up on the Screen Australia website um, because they decided somehow that we were dummies and that we would be impressed by an image of two women looking at themselves in a phone. It's not a mirror, but I think the idea is there. So um, here we've come full circle back to where I started the lecture. Uh, oh, and this is what someone did to undermine Screen Australia. They put up an alternative website called Understanding Funding Announcements, a special supplement for ladies, <laughs> which was a joke, but quite a clever one, I thought. Okay, um, other responses have been more interesting. So this was a, an alternative visualization um, that someone in the audience of one of my talks produced and, and put up in Instagram. So they were describing the, in particular, the visualization of the research funding as a bloodbath, a period piece or a clusterfuck. Um, this is a response by an 11 year old who was in one of the lectures where I presented this data, which I really love because what she was trying to do, she was just doodling and her mum sent this to me. She's actually trying to think about what a data visualization would look like if it wasn't about gender offenders, if, if you had something more equitable. So I always like to put this up because I think this is, this is a beautiful kind of doodle of aspiration, the aspirations of a young woman. Um, I, I just put this up because I'm, I love the Dave thing. Friends of Dave Inc, where everyone is called Dave. Um, believe it or not, the Dave research did end up as promotional material on a hard lemonade can. Hard lemonade is alcoholic lemonade. <laughs> it only has 3% alcohol, but you know, we can always increase. Um, so yeah, um, that's just bizarre. I actually have, just so that you know, it's real and I didn't Photoshop that. There is real cans of lemonade. <clears throat> All right, and but this is one of my favorites. I like to have this as my screensaver. Um, the idea of accountability extends to the team and we periodically check in and perform analysis on ourselves. Um, and this is a, an article that was recently published where we used some of these network visualizations to analyze our own collaborations and our own interconnections um, as a way to try and improve equity within our group. Um, so you're, uh, you can find this on the, the Nexus website if you're interested to read it. And that is that. Thank you everyone for actually staying awake for all of it. Thank you very much. This was great. Um, so yeah, it's it's always so odd that we we can't applause, um, but I'm pretty sure <laughs> lots of applause. <laughs> we should uh, write to Zoom and tell them to improve. You know, they need a exactly. Uh, there's lots of like, yellow hands going up if you if you um, see the gallery of the of the profile. So th this was this was very exciting, and there's there's lots of. Um, um, very, very interesting overlap and even things where you have uh, that you ascribe to digital humanities where that resonate a lot with 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 uh, my own kind of thoughts on things, but uh, I don't want to occupy this. So um, questions from the audience. Um, and some of us are blocked from the chat for unmuting. So I've locked the um, meeting now long enough, I guess. There is no offenders in this thing. So I allow everybody to participate in the chat. Please have bursts of uh, writing questions. Um, it should work now. But uh, you can also um, speak up because I allow you to unmute. So if you um, want to ask a question, if you're here to Zoom bomb us, you will be immediately thrown out of this meeting if there is anybody left. So, yes. Hi, Max, this is Pia. <laughs> Hi, Deb. Uh, thanks Hello. for the great presentation. Uh, I'm basically, I cannot show my face. Uh, uh, I can, I can <laughs> solve that too. Okay, now you can Okay, I, just to, just to uh, appear on, on the screen, maybe. 
You should not. Yes. Thank you. OK, yes. OK. Hi, Pia. <laughs> Hi. Thank, thank you for for very, very uh, interesting and touchy uh, talk, because, of course, myself as a filmmaker, my background in, in, in film uh, is, is, is uh, of course, uh, really much related to this, uh, this gender issue topic, but trying to stay a little bit out of that. Uh, so uh, these uh, crafts uh, that you presented, they, they were really uh, a really powerful uh, way to actually uh, really show through your visual perception the, the differences between quantities and masses. Uh, so uh, I don't myself do data analysis. I'm not the calculator, I'm the data analyst. Uh, as, as, as uh, that's not my background, but uh, fascinating. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, hello. <laughs> I'm, uh, th thank you. That was quite, quite interesting, inspiring talk. Uh, I'm, I'm Mark. I'm, I'm um, so a junior uh, uh, research fellow in Kodan. So I'm, I'm doing my, just began my PhD. Here. And, and my background is actually semiotics, so it's more humanities focused and mm -hmm. not so much knowledge and data science. And, and that's why I, I would bring out that it was quite uh, intriguing to hear that, that how, how you stressed uh, that it is data analytics, data science, and your approach is really taking into consideration this kind of uh, first person perspective you would say, and it's kind of like has this critical aspect to it. And uh, it, it is pretty interesting. I, I, I'm, I'm curious, could you also, do you want to comment yourself also on the idea that what do you see, how is the uh, current situation in kind of this data science, uh, like uh, currently, and how it seems to be developed in the sense of uh, taking into consideration this uh, first person and critical perspective? that it wouldn't be uh, fully positivistic and naturalistic. Yeah, look, I think um, I, I did that pretty deliberately because I think most of the ways in which data science has developed and is being discussed is from positivist traditions. Um, a project I didn't talk about that I've worked on for a number of years is called the Humanities Networked Infrastructure Virtual Laboratory. And that was an experiment in information organization that enables people to use the graph, to use network visualizations, to propose ontologies from below. So to, use, to create vernacular ontologies using everyday language. And one of the reasons we did that, um, well, there are many reasons, but, but one of them in particular was that conventional information science doesn't allow you to propose not relationships. So this is not related to that or you know it's a it's entirely driven by positivist concerns that the world is is there and it is describable and it is describable through the assertion of existence through this kind of positive framework um, and in the humanities it's equally important to be able to refuse that to be able to say that something is not and and again that I think comes back to those that value of contestation of, of complexity, of um, contingency, which are things that positivist thinking tends to try and make more efficient and reduce. And, and for the humanities, it's, it's actually about producing much more in, in terms of complexity. So, you know, a typical graph is built from a triple. Uh, what we were hoping to do in the Honey Lab is make the triple capable of being much, much, much more complex and have a, an enormous amount of detail and nuance rather than just a simplified structured vocabulary that you would see in a typical information graph. Um, so yeah, I, I'm, I mean, I mean it's, it's a really interesting question to me because, because the problem of positivism has turned up in my work in lots of different ways and uh, even though I'm not always, that's not always the key problem that I'm trying to resolve. It, it certainly was in that particular project, the Honey project. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, add something um, or, or uh, yeah. kind of um, 
I, I sort of, after art history, um, doing a PhD there, entered a, a physics lab uh, in network science. And one of the key striking moments why I didn't, why I, I'm very hesitant to use the word digital humanities to describe what I'm doing, is exactly that kind of um, being rooted in, in philosophy, ontology, hierarchical descriptions of things and stuff like that. While if you go to network science, particularly systems biology and but also electric circuits with um, you know the, where yeah. the gates and computers come from um, these kind of relations are, are are basically part of the game you, you just have to yeah. you know you have in in biology you have links and you have inhibitors and uh, there is and or not whatever gates yeah. and and so the interesting thing is that if we um, sort of go full out to, to, to the natural sciences. One of the interesting things is that all these uh, things we, uh, we find as problems in the humanities all of a sudden uh, are, are, are researched by thousands of people, which ironically, systems biology is quite funny because it, it has a higher percentage of women than, mm. uh, than the philosophy we, we, we think is humanities-like, which is quite funny. Um, yeah. And, no, and I think you're right, yeah. <laughs> And, and, and so this, this brings me to this one thing, like I had many, many questions and, and things, but there's one thing I would like to go to, which is uh, this, this idea of using sort of police and counterterrorism methods. Um, I had a neighbor in Texas who worked for um, a, a qualitative intelligence agency doing stuff like that. And what's quite funny is that um, there is a, there's also a spectrum of how this is used. And hmm. um, in one of the weird convolutions of my life, I, I, I was in, in a room with General McChrystal for 20 minutes where he explained how they, oh, took, wow. out, where he took, out, where they took out the terrorists in Iraq, exactly using that pattern. They took out the hubs, they killed the person, searched the apartment, looked for names, went to the next apartment, which they found in the apartment before, killed that person too, and like did the same game until they were gone. And so that worked very well, quote unquote, for Al Qaeda in Iraq, but didn't work in Afghanistan. But they used the same method. But then they figured out uh, that uh, there was always a source for young terrorists that would take over the leadership, even though they were at some point they were 18. And 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 so my question to him was like, oh, what's this like in cancer when you radiate the body of the cancer, but then at some point you end up with stem cells, and once the body's removed, it just permutates in very different ways. He said, like, yeah, exactly. There were people in mosques, uh, like conservative mothers and grandfathers, who would nurture anybody who can fight to actually continue the fight. So taking out the hubs may be one thing, but the question is, I think, how about education? How about, how about finding the root cause of where, where does this actually come from? That is sort of something which I think we, we haven't solved. It, we, we also haven't solved it for Nazism, as we have just seen. We got swastikas on the screen. We haven't um, solved it for civil liberties of, um, you know, the POC people in the U.S. And um, it's way more hidden here. But obviously, you know, if you're Russian, your chances are lower in this country. While if you're Estonian in Russia, it's probably the same thing. If you're Turkish in Germany, it's the same thing. So the question is, how do we actually tackle this? You, you do this for a very long time, so you may have an answer. But I literally don't have an answer. Um, how do so there, we there are, tackle the root yeah, cause? I think the there are several things you've said there, which I think are really mm -hmm. interesting. So the first one is, um, whilst it might have worked in Iraq, it didn't work in Afghanistan. And I would argue that that might be reflected if you were to do deeper network mm -hmm. analysis at the level of the, the attributes of the network themselves. And so modularity would appear to be higher in Afghanistan than than in Iraq, for example. So, you know, mm -hmm. you have that sense of the network folding back in to, to cover for the gaps when you take someone out. Um, when I showed the, the original visualization of the gender offenders, you would have seen the hubs were quite close at the center, but around the edge, they, they appear looser. Mm -hmm. And in criminal network analysis, they call those isolates. And, and initially they would disregard them because they would say, oh, well, we're only after the big players in the middle. Later generations of criminal network analysis has looked at those isolates and said, actually, they're very interesting because what they tell you is you don't have all the, all the attributes you need to connect them to the center. They're there for a reason. You just haven't, you're not looking at the right attributes. And so I did that analysis on that particular cohort 
-hmm. And what I discovered was that there was something that connected those isolates around the edge to the center. It wasn't age. Mm -hmm. It wasn't color. It was class. Mm -hmm. So it was education. They all went to the same private boys schools. And and so what you're saying about, you know, this cultural system that sort of sits behind and enables the network to be sustained, um, in the case of Afghanistan, it's the mosques and the education system and so on. In the case of Australian screen industry patriarchy, it's private schools mm -hmm. and class. These are old, what we would call in English, old boys networks, right? Mm -hmm. And it's a classic encapsulation of that. Um, so I think that, that that observation is super interesting. But yeah, how do you get to the root cause of the problem? And this is an interesting one because uh, work that June actually assisted us with um, did some quite interesting correlate analysis where we examined the gender gap in um, film screenings and cinema screenings of films by women in different countries. And we compared that to the gender gap index, which is published globally every year. And what we discovered is in fact, that there was a correlation between the gender gap index in particular countries and that country's recept receptivity or, or ability to receive films directed by women. And when you see correlates like that, you start to realize that this is a set of interrelated infrastructures, you know, the political system, the cultural system, the education system, they all inter interrelate in complex ways. And there is no one size fits all solution. You know, we can't just fix everything simultaneously, but maybe they reverberate. You know, maybe there's a kind of an, what I call an infrapuncture, an infrapuncture approach where you put the needle down like an acupuncture and it reverberates out. So you solve one problem at a time and you hope that by solving or resolving pain in one place, it, it will reverberate and then you'll find the next pain point and so on a little bit like Chinese acupuncture mm -hmm. so if we can solve the problem in the film industry well maybe that will have implications for the problem then in the education industry or in you know that you'll start to see those reverberations um, everywhere but it will differ from one place to another as simple as the difference between Iraq and Afghanistan or in the case of the film industry between Germany Sweden and Australia in terms of the data we've looked at to apply the solution we would think to apply in Australia would not work because of the different nature of those networks. I, I just think it, you start to then have to get into the nuance and complexity of, of the specifics. And that's that great thing about big data is this scalability. You know, you can, you can observe a problem from above, but you have to get down on the ground to really make the changes to see them mm -hmm. reverberate through the system. Mila, I think you had a, had your hand up. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, you know, I, I just want to thank you for, for this talk. I think there were kind of like a lot of very interesting points. Um, but I have maybe questions uh, regarding plurality, kind of like continuing what, what you have been now discussing uh, on the kind of like gender gaps and, and, and like that. I was just wondering, have you been looking at... Um, is there a way to show a benefit of varied groups for for filmmakers? The kind of like um, how integrating different kinds of perspectives in the groups affects actually the films and and how they are. I, I think that's this is of course think a thing that I have been thinking because we, at least I, seem to assume that. Um, plurality is kind of like beneficial and it provides kind of like more interesting results, more interesting research and so on. But I have not encountered, maybe I haven't been looking at, looking for, but I haven't really encountered uh, studies that would kind of like show in structured way, maybe, uh, structured ways maybe how actually this plurality or, or integration of different kinds of perspective actually affects the results that a film group or, or a research group or another would kind of like. I, I, and I, of course, hope that th that would be a way to show that this is kind of like beneficial. It kind of like leads something to more interesting results. And maybe to continue with this openness and, and plurality, Kind of like I, I go back to your the beginning of your talk um, as as you were talking that uh, it's important um, for us to take seriously 
the others in a way and and kind of so uh, well as we also encountered uh, at the beginning of of your talk with the uh, zoom um, attack uh, so sometimes uh, openness can be also lead to to unpredictable effects and and kind of like something scary or something that we don't we we are not we don't want to have like um, I'm working on on um, fake history or, or pseudo history and I'm, I'm looking at um, like in Finland and in Russia how people distribute uh, and create fake histories in the internet and it's kind of like interesting to look at how these infrastructures allow democrat democratization of of knowledge in a way but at the same time it of course leads to uh, results that um, we don't necessarily, uh, or it's is uh, difficult to uh, appreciate, or or it's difficult to understand where it actually comes from. So it's kind of like mixes the kind of like the perception of truth in a way. So I don't know how to, you know, maybe these these were not very clear questions, but I maybe you want to comment some somehow my thoughts. Thanks. Uh, I do. Um... So I have a, a number of things to to respond because you've got many questions in there. But um, the first one around um, are the benefits of diverse or plural teams in the screen industry evident? There's absolutely been evidence and there has been for years that films that involve women in the key creative team do better financially than films that don't. Um, on a dollar for dollar basis. So for every dollar you spend, you'll get more than that dollar invested back at a higher rate if a woman directs the film or if there's a number of women in the key creative team. Um, so some colleagues of, of mine and June's worked on a study um, looking in particular at the German film industry in relation to this, but there's also been studies done in Hollywood that demonstrate this. Patriarchy would rather leave money on the table then do the do the right thing and have diversity. Uh, this is why it's ideological and not just based on pure logic or logical economics, predictably predictable behaviour. Um, related to that was uh, two things I wanted to say. The first is clearly uh, in relation to plurality and diversity, our studies are very limited. We only look at binary gender. The world is not a binary world, um, and so. Uh, you know, I want to upfront now the limitations of our own work. It's it fails dismally to account for plurality at that level. It's a very very blunt instrument. Um, there are all sorts of really interesting dimensions to collecting data on gender minorities or non-binary gender, on racial data and so on, which make it very hard to produce the kind of work we would like to do. Um, and I don't have a short answer for how to solve that. So um, that's, I think that is the big question that confronts everybody now, um, because collecting the data in order to come up with innovative answers to how to create the conditions for more diversity is also just the act of collecting the data is in and of itself problematic. So you, in a sense, you have to you have to make more of a problem in order to solve the problem that you've sort of made. I don't know how to get out of that. Um, it's a really tricky issue. The related again to that question is the stuff around openness and its relationship to diversity. Um, we worked uh, in particular with an article by a scholar called I think his name is Mark Lata L U W T E R. Um, in which he looks at uh, the entire history of Hollywood and examines the periods in which uh, people who were uh, in a minority were able to succeed or flourish. And he defines those periods as periods in which the network is most open. So what he says we should be looking for in the data is open, the most open aspects of a network. So that might be a small world, a vision of a small world network or some aspect of a small world network with variations according to circumstance. But um, his, his theory in a sense is saying, don't put the cart before the horse, like don't look for um, 
openness this I guess this relates to the, the the question I opened at the beginning which is how do we use data to produce openness how do we understand openness as how do we redefine openness or how do we even define it and if we can do that then we can think about creating space for change rather than putting the onus for change on minorities themselves who are not actually engaged in the network in positions of agency or or positions of power or control. That being said, your criticism of openness is a really good one. And of course, it's it's one that's been brought up by the, those same minorities because um, for, and I'll just use an example to hand that I have, um, for many indigenous people um, publishing data that they haven't themselves been part of producing or part of controlling is very problematic and it can often be used against them. So I think um, when I talk about openness, it's in a very idealistic framework. It's not necessarily meant to say that openness in every set of circumstances means the same thing or should be, um, should be a one size fits all solution because of course I'm against those one size fits all solutions. So I, take, I totally take your point there. Um, and now I've lost track of all the questions. I think you might have had one more, but Mark. there's another person with their hand up as well. And Mark, yeah, Mark. and Mar, Mar. Yes, Mar, you have your hand lifted, and uh, since a while, uh, you can unmute yourself, please. Yes. Ah, uh, hello. Very, very interesting presentation. I really like it. I, I am Mar. I'm also a junior fellow in Kudan, and. Uh, actually, you point out one thing that I want to ask you that is about the education, because I did, uh, I am I am foreigner in Estonia, I'm from Barcelona, uh, Spain, or Catalonia, actually I'm Catalan, I'm native, my native language is Catalan, and the, the, I make a graph, or, I mean a visual artist, I'm a practicing visual artist, and I was a little bit like um, ashamed that when they were always talking about Estonian artists, and, and then I did a network. And I try to link between them uh, with the data that is available on, on their website. And, and I realized one thing, there is only two artists that they succeed, that they don't come from ECA, that is the um, Estonian Art Academy in, in Tallinn. And, mm -hmm. and one, it succeed in Estonia is, uh, is Katia Noviskova, when was acquired by MoMA. And then they quickly, they gave the uh, Venice Pavilion. And I told you why, it's because she has a Russian name, um, surname. And if you also see the, the, the Estonian artists who succeed, the, the Russian surnames are not appearing really much uh, on the, on the um, but coming back to this uh, education, uh, I just check it out to background check. Uh, Turner uh, was Royal College of Art alumni. Um, means um, it actually, the hypothesis is this, that actually where these people come from, they build a network and then it's really tied. I mean, I am, as a practicing artist, I, I know this because uh, you can, I, I mean, I am from Barcelona, but I, then I migrated to UK, then I was in, in, in Austria, and now I'm landed here in Estonia because I actually work with my wife as an artist duo. And, and I suffered this in the both places I am from like in Estonia and, and Barcelona, where I am outsider on both because I'm not belonging to the main network. But then we, uh, suddenly, I don't know why, we are internationally uh, recognized and we do exhibitions all over. But in the cities that we are from, we are kind of uh, on the periphery, not in the center. Uh, yeah. And it's because the center is very tight. And, and this is, um, I mean, I think that uh, I totally agree that the gender is an issue, but I think the tightness of this of this network is also an issue. That is very uh, and and this I think is is due to several things. One is public funding, like you were saying. I think that this network tight the public fundings, and they don't let to enter other people in. And also, it's not the public funding; it's actually institutions also, because you can see. I mean, I can talk more about the the visual arts. Uh, you can see, for example, few curators that they manage their, like they control the whole city. I can tell you in Barcelona, there's four curators that they do mostly all exhibitions. 
and in Estonia is more or less the same. And then these ones, they actually are the ones who control the circle who enter in, in, the, in the things. And I, I believe that in cinema might be the same with uh, the, the, the ones who put the money, the, the, um, uh, the producers or um, um, plus other, I mean, it's very hierarchical. I, well, that's what I know from the cinema perspective. So the challenge is how do we move from the observation of closed defensive networks because they exist everywhere right? They exist in education systems, they exist in universities, they exist in research networks, they exist everywhere. Closed defensive networks, it's how power persists through the application of closed defensive networks. So we know they exist, we know what they look like now, you know, I can, I can visualize them for you. What, what is our aspiration for change? What is what, what is, what would what we want to see look like? What, what's the vision? And, the, and we don't know yet because it's very hard to find a world in which there are not these closed defensive networks. Um, and so Lutter in, is really interesting to me because he comes close to trying to understand what the alternative would look like. So if we know what the alternative looks like, then we can start to go, well, here's the closed defensive network. Here's the network we'd like. What are the mechanisms for moving from one to the other? And what would that look like in a policy context? So that's the project that I'm working on next. You know, this is the project we just got the ORA funding for, which is to try and think about how we move from the existing situation of closed defensive networks to networks that actually enable or allow for more open mobility on the part of people at the currently at the periphery for people to flourish and live their lives as variously as possible to quote myself from earlier in the lecture that's the network we want thank you very much this is super super fascinating we have three minutes to go and i would like to give the word to you uh, maybe for for a kind of closing statement but i'm i, I I'm, I'm very happy about exactly the last uh, 30 seconds because i uh, actually also the, you last answered um that you know this gender issue is super super important just like the racial issue is super super important but uh, there is something even more deep lurking below the surface which is hard to grasp because we cannot put binary categories on it there is there are problems of confusion um, in the technical uh, term you know for example all people who are not only who are gender in between, but um, you know, how about people who are both Estonian and Russian or black and white? And uh, you know, like Trevor Noah famously in South Africa is white and America is black. And so there, the, the, the key question is exactly how do, we, um, how do we address this? And what you just said, closed defensive networks, where it's not about reviewer number three, but uh, about reviewer number 37, we've all mm -hmm. met him. Um, there's, uh, if, if, if it, it's about these deeper infrastructures where we want to find ways, how can we actually build a better, more open society? This is something that um, I, I think would be very, very worthwhile to, to pursue, not only in research groups, but also in groups of groups. And um, I do think that the funders who want to, for example, fund multidisciplinarity have this big problem. They are aware of it. They've tried around since decades how to how do they actually overcome this kind of problems of multidisciplinarity, of invisible colleges and so on. And, and, and so I do think that this is actually, we can make a very, very, very big contribution to society because um, there is just no solution and the solution will probably be found by research. We have to look at the data. I think that's the, the, the cool thing. And um, I would like to underscore what you said at the beginning and multiple times throughout this thing. It's not about opening the data, it's about, using data to produce more openness. This is very much how I would like to see the open in this open lab seminar uh, and in the Kudan open lab as such, uh, because we all know there is data. You don't want to spill out in the open because, you know, proprietary company is going to pick up and, and, and raise the inequality by, by having it around. While a true openness and a true open society may, for example, entail that we keep our data or some of it at least. So um, I, I would like to give you the last word on this. Um, so we're very, very happy to have you here. And there's, we, we could go on for at least two hours. I have enough questions, I'm pretty, pretty sure many people have. So thank you very much for all this.
Oh, no, I just want to say thank you. I mean, Max, that was, it was a really great session and I really appreciated the questions. They were spot on. Um, I think that uh, as, you, as you just described, it's, it's about understanding and redefining openness as our objective in the broadest sense of social justice and not just thinking about the data as the numbers. Mm -hmm. you know, we have to think about the values, not the numbers. And, and that's the most important message to remember whenever we work with data. Thank you very much. This was great. Um, next Monday.